Uh, welcome to our honourable speaker, Dr. Muhammad Tazli, uh, from Scholar Malaysia. So before we continue, I would like to introduce our honourable speaker for today's session, Dr. Muhammad Tazli bin Azizan. He is currently a founder of Scholar Malaysia. Okay, uh, sorry. He was a former associate professor at University of Malaysia Police, UNIMA, in 2021, and at University of Technology Petronas, UTP for which he has served the institution for the past 17 years. He is graduated uh, his PhD in chemical engineering from Imperial College, funded by Commonwealth uh, Scholarships in 2014, and being appointed as one of the National Education Policy Reform Task Force members from October 2018 until April, April 2019. Serving the former Education Minister in 2019, he was also seconded to Perak ICT and Multimedia GLC, Digital Para as the Chief Executive Officer for nine months. To date, he has delivered more than 100 trainings and as plenary speakers for various teaching and learning events and conferences. In 2021 alone, he has delivered 25 online webinars and workshops related to online learning, promoting cognitive engagement, hybrid learning and hearts assessment. Attention to participants, if uh, you have a question, so you can strictly uh, unmute your microphone or you can state your question in the chat room. So you uh, so uh, our speaker will answer you strictly. And for those who are not yet uh, logged in to Canva, please do so. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Muhammad Tazli in order to start the sharing session. Over to you, Dr. Tazli. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you to Dr. Nomazlina for and and calm team lah uh, for inviting me to this uh, particular session. Uh, it's very calming to hear calm. Um, I, I I never come across uh, any other center of teaching and learning as calming as calm. So. Uh, <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's my uh, honor to to be here, although virtually, but uh, I'm, I'm very pleased um, to be sharing with you about the topics that um, I'll be sharing today. So let me put up here on the screen. Throughout these two hours, um, in, there will be uh, some activities that we'll be doing together. Um, on top of that, um, there'll be some discussion as well. So I hope that all of you could participate because um, I believe in, uh, I do not believe in, in, in disseminating knowledge by just, you know, one way talk, one way, one way of teaching. That, that is not, for me, that is not teaching. <laughs> um, that is just transmitting the knowledge, um, but um, it doesn't work that way because most of the time, when uh, when you just talk alone on your own and just let others listening, most of the time you expect that people will understand it is a ball and up you will think it is a chicken. So that's why it is very important to do hands on together so that and then we can enhance via discussion um, so that we can understand better in terms of the topics that we are discussing today. So the topic is promoting cognitive engagement via online remote learning. So we want to see how can we cognitively engage our students, um, even though we had to do it online. So what can be done? So today we're going to look at the, um, why does there is some disengagement happen among our students? And then what has been done? Uh, what has been done, which means that we can actually self-check on ourselves what we have done before and to an extent that we'll be able to cognitively engage our students. The third one is actually looking at what is the way forward, what else that could be done and what can be concluded from what is actually our way forward um, uh, after this kind of workshop that, that, uh, that is, could possibly be done inside our class. So before we proceed, I would like you to go to Mentimeter Okay, um, get the chat. So can anyone go, uh, you can click the link that I shared here, or you can also go to www.menti.com and use the code 8182072. Okay, um, or you can click the link that I put in the chat. 
uh, can you please answer this? I just wanted to know um, how many of you have tried using Canva? How many of you have tried using Mentimeter? Um, how about uh, breakout functions? How many of you have been using breakout functions? And how many of you have been using um, collaboration with Canva? Um, if you if you notice, actually, uh, I'll be sharing with you later that if you are using Canva, you can also collaborate um, in using the Canva platform. I can see that it's a, a lot of in terms of the number is quite big, which means that uh, most of you have been using Canva, have been using uh, Mentimeter. Uh, a lot of you also have been using breakout functions, out of which is, is, is quite a good number from 11 out of 17. Um, 12 out of 17 that um, you're using this kind of uh, platform, except maybe a few of you haven't tried any of this. But never mind, we are going to be exposed to this from time to time um, and then uh, maybe some of you have been using Canva but you have not looked into collaboration with Canva which means that that could be an added value that 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 could help you uh, to to, sup to support your students so that they can collaborate using Canva um, okay what else uh, we we still have about roughly 49 participants maybe minus me minus co-host about two people 46 so usually i would expect to get response more than 50 percent only then we move uh, i will always tell my students if i'm using mentimeter i expect the response to be more than 50 percent so right now not enough yet so support that respond again we have not yet responded kindly please respond okay we got enough response thank you so um, we can see that most of you have been using Canva, Mentimeter, Breakout Functions, but not many of you have been using collaboration with Canva. And not many of you haven't tried any of this, which is, which is a good sign. That's good. I think Come have been using, have been um, promoting a lot of these kind of tools. So that's, that's very, very good. Okay. Um, I'm sharing with you here uh, a link so that you can access similarly to my Canva design. So can you please click the link and join this platform where actually we're going to collaborate together. Everybody click the link on uh, given on the chat section. Okay. So now this is the way actually that we can uh, participate in in what we call as um, Canva that we can collaborate. Everybody can collaborate to do the design together. Oh, very advanced. <laughs> Straight away put the emoji. Okay, I just want you to focus on page one. Don't go yet to other pages. Okay, just focus on page one about team check-in. So what you can do is actually you can go to the um, uh, to the left uh, bar and there is a button we call emoji. So you can click on that and pick your own emoji. Okay, select your own emoji and and share it here. What you can do is I just just actually uh, click on it. Okay, you can click on the emoji. And then basically it will appear. And what you can do is actually just need to maybe resize it so that everybody else can uh, can also put their, their emojis as well. Of course, it will appear a bit weak in the first place, but just need to resize it. Okay. So now we have only about 12 people join, uh, nine so what you can do is actually just pick your own emoji as i mentioned go to the left bar left tools and then pick emoji and then you can just actually highlight um, what is emoji that you want to share what kind of emoji that you want to share oh sorry this is not it's supposed to be page this page one i'm the one who's supposed to go to page one it's okay everybody so go to page one and put down your emoji
drag it up and then I will try to bring it everywhere here and there. So try to resize it to make it much more smaller so that everybody can participate. That is a kimono here, somebody playing with um, Okay, good. <laughs> now let's let let us move to the to the to the next page. I'll, um, I'm gonna bring you to the next page. Okay. Uh, but uh, since we have a few people here, I'm going to uh, give a bit more space. Lah. Um, I don't want to actually every one of you cramming on the same page. So what I'm gonna do is I'll be duplicating page here. Um. So in my duplicate page, um, so what I'm going to do is actually this page two is reserved for those whose name starting from A until A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, let's say until J, A until J can use page two. And then um, in this page, I would say, K L M N O P Q R K until K K to I think K to M K to R lah okay. K to R right for those names be belong to A to J you can go to page somebody <laughs> okay. Not page, I think I'll be, I delete this page and page two. So now, now page three become page two. So for those whose name is A to J, um, you can go to page two. Uh, name of K to R, please go to page three. The remaining from S to Z. So you can go to page four, okay? So uh, don't, don't delete, what you can do is actually don't delete anything. Eh? Uh, so, but once you actually you feel that you're doing mistake, you need to select those things that you need the mistake first, only then you delete. Otherwise, if let's say you delete anywhere else, that page will be gone. Uh, okay. So we go to page uh, for those names A to J, go to page two. Uh, with K to R, go to page three. And with the remaining, go to page four. So, um, the question is actually, what's your frequently used emoji if it comes to your class? I wanted to know your feeling when actually you go to your class, when you conduct your class session. And uh, once you have your emoji, and then I would like you to actually uh, copy, okay, let me, this is ungroup. Okay, copy, copy this. And, um, Copy this. What you can do in order for you to copy is actually you just need to hold Control C and then Control V. So actually you will be able to get um to get this together. Okay. I need to actually make it um as a group. Okay, so uh, right now saya dah actually, okay, now first thing first before you copy and paste tu, you try to put your emoji dulu. Okay, before we put the copy and paste punya part tu. Okay, you, you can actually put your emoji first and then you copy and paste dekat, dekat emoji tu and explain about it. Alright, untuk this this one juga saya pun nak ungroup. So I need to regroup balik. Okay, now uh, in page four for those who actually pick your emoji, you can actually go to the the notes. Okay, just click on the notes, copy, control C, and then after that you can paste. So paste and then bring it uh, to your emoji, and then write down why actually that you pick that emoji. Okay, 
because the question is what's your frequently used emoji <laughs> ni ada dia tulis tembak pelajar yang perlu ditembak <laughs> okay so there is a question the how is my student first impression my parents okay ke ah okay Alright ni Dr. Mazlina punya team kat sini. Okay. Put your emoji and then um, and put a sticky note near your emoji and write down your write down your your reason why is that emoji. Okay macam mana nak write down tu? Actually you just double click on it and then um, double click on that sticky notes and then you'll be able to write something. Learning should be fun. Um, that is the comment part. Um, uh, you can actually write it down the card. Um, tepi tu. Okay, this one, this this group have a big, a bit big emoji size, so you can actually make it smaller. So you can actually. Put it together so that everybody can have some space. To show that I'm your lecturer and you will be apa tu, with me. Okay. Always feel happy, feel good. Uh, Nur Nadira kat sini tengah ada excited. Uh, Uh, there is an alien here. Learn at your pace. I can't wait for you. <laughs> I can wait or I, I, I can't wait or I can wait. Uh, how to write note? Okay, you just need to copy paste. Pergi dekat atas tu. Copy. Control C and then bring it. Bring it to your and, and then paste. Control C and Control V. Uh, and then you can just paste near to your emoji. And then double click on it. And then you can actually start to write down there. Okay. Uh, to show that I'm aware, accept and noted. Good. <laughs> All right. Um... <coughs> Okay, so now I think everybody have some taste lah about um, we started to have a collaboration uh, on the same page where actually we can use Canva. Uh, sometimes if you if you've been thinking before about uh, if if you've been using Google Jamboard, uh, it's almost similar things. But actually, of course, you know that Canva can do much more than that. Canva can help you with the design with the poster or so except that today i wanted to bring canva for collaboration so that everybody can actually collaborate with canva and me as the instructor i can just put a comment i, I would just write down good job uh, everyone uh, so that i can just put my comment it's not my picture it's don picture my scholar malaysia punya partner gets to it's account actually so but then you can see that um as an instructor you can use it um, whenever the students participate in the discussion, collaborate, you can give some comments. Um, or, for example, like when you combine it with breakout session, later I'll, I'll, we'll be using breakout session. And then after that, how can we use Canva so that students can participate to discuss about something? Okay, so let's move back to our main slide uh, that I didn't share the link here. I share different, I create a different uh, slide so that everybody can participate. Because I didn't share my link here, because I do not want everybody to just to write something down here and and edit things here. Um, so, doctor, sorry, yeah. doctor, for interrupting you. So in Canva, um, yeah Sometimes kita guna um, slide presentation, poster, and so on. This one, untuk uh, untuk yang this activity, doctor gunakan apa? What is the uh, name of the? Uh, I just use I, I just make it a slide, make it a slide, oh, make it slide. Mm, make it slide. Okay. Uh, but I actually give a link share kat sini. 
so that uh, you can either edit, use as a template, or use to view. Okay. All right. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank you. But if let's say right now, I don't want anybody to interrupt with my slide. Uh, what I'm going to give is actually, I just give share and I give a share a link to view. So everybody right now can, uh, when I share right now in the chat section, a link, you can actually see my slide without having be able to edit it. Uh, so it's just view, viewing the slide right now, the main, the main slide. Okay, we have done that part. So let's get started. Lah. <laughs> let's get started. Um, let's get started in a way that I'm going to bring you um, to a, a video. Um, just wonder if, let's say, do you happen to be in this situation before? In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone, anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something DOO economics, voodoo economics. Okay, so have you actually, have you as a student, have you encountered this kind of situation before? Maybe, maybe not the lecturer like asking you anyone, 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 and maybe he's just like actually just being in front of the slide and just talk about all by himself. Or perhaps you have encountered this, um, or maybe, maybe we are not the students actually. Um, for example, like there is a lecturer who actually just teaching the slides online, teaching online and just talk nonstop and, and without any kind of engagement. So you can see that from the facial expression of the students, um, I would imagine if let's say we are doing the same thing to our student, we're actually facing similar thing like this. Perhaps that's why most of them, um, they are present in online. Then they, whenever that we conduct some class, they are there. But when you try to call out their name, they're not there because perhaps they just left <laughs> because they, they are not there um, because they found it is not, they, they found it as not engaging with them. So how to make sure that our online um, when whenever that we are conducting online lecture, online teaching, for example, it has to be engaging, be it a synchro synchronous approach or be it a synchronous approach. So that's what, what we want to see. But um, now let's, let's, let's do some Canva activity, but I'm, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put you in a breakout session. Okay, I'm going to put you in a breakout session for a while so that you can discuss about um, what have you done before, okay? The challenge in engaging with the students, um, what are the challenges that you, you come across and what have you done to overcome it? So for the next one minute, um, just think it on your own first, okay? Think on your own first, individually think about a challenge or some challenges that you have gone through throughout your online teaching experience and how have you overcome it? That's number one. Okay. So what are the challenges that you have gone? What what are the challenges that you have gone through? You have tried here and there, but perhaps some challenge that you have gone through. Number one. Um, the second one is I'm going to put you later in a breakout session for the next maybe 10 minutes so that actually you can discuss about it. Um we're going to use the link as the Canva link tadi so that everybody within the breakout will be actually typing down and share later. And after that, I will close the room and we're going to share it with the whole class. Okay. 
So let me actually set up the breakout first while you thinking the answer so that you can actually um, so roughly we have a participant about 51 uh, I anticipate that some maybe have some other work to be done so let me create in a way that um, we have roughly about 8 okay. Okay. Uh, I'll create 7 groups right now uh, so actually later on dalam uh, Canva tu okay so I'm going to bring you back to the link earlier okay so we're going to go to this so I'm going to create another two more room duplicate page duplicate page so for those who will be assigned to room one please go to page six okay for those who are actually going to room six you can go to page 11 and room 7 go to page 12 later on okay so i have already prepared a template about what is actually my challenge and how i overcome it or plan to do lah if let's say you haven't done anything yet but what you plan to do you can just write it down later on so uh, i'm going to put you now in the breakout um, groups so let's say we're going to stop by uh, we're going to give about roughly about 15 minutes and I'll, I'll be doing some round over there and then see how um kalau tak siap lagi then we keep up to 20 minutes but but don't take too long but don't take too long um okay so I'm going to create uh groups right now uh and then you'll see where actually that you belong to okay. make sure you stay as well join the Canva so that you can see actually the task is already given in page five the instruction is, is giving in page five. Okay, we're going to start the breakout session. Okay, please join the session. Right now, I have opened the room. Okay, um, sorry to cut short, uh, everyone. Uh, tapi, I, I hope that... Uh, all of you have uh, some experience of using the tool and then um, be able to discuss using the breakout while actually trying to complete the task given uh, in the Canva punya part. Um, I hope that you get you, 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 you got some, some kind of experience. Of course, this will come with, um, from time to time, it will come uh, handy, lah, which means that you, you'll be able to be better at um, trying to complete the task accordingly. Uh, I have actually uh, been using Canva for collaboration ni for quite some times. For example, like uh, if I may share with you about, uh, what is it? Uh, that I have actually made some folders, for example, like here. Uh, this is actually some kind of breakout activities that I have conducted uh, with my students, for example. Um, so sometimes I give them uh, to do in the class. Sometimes they are actually doing it. Um, they are actually doing it um, outside of the class, asynchronous. So they are discussing about it. For example, like I give you, I give them a final, some, some kind of final exam question. But instead of just asking them to solve the question, uh, I ask them to identify similarities, the differences, tricky part, highlight anything that you are not familiar with. So this is actually the question. And then this is actually part of their task that they have been doing and answering. Lah. For, for example, different students different, from different rooms. This is actually the um, synchronous, during synchronous session. Lah. So they are participating and they are actually giving answer. And after that, what I did is actually I... I went through for each of these um, answer, try to give them feedback about whether what they are doing is it correct or it needs some kind of improvement. So perhaps um, maybe I am not going to actually go through all of these um, slides here, but uh, maybe I can ask someone of you. Perhaps you can share your findings from your discussion. Um, 
maybe we can start with room one. Uh, room one, tadi room one ni, actually dia ada someone who actually hijack room one. Um, they are not in the team but they actually they doing work in the room one. Uh, so, for, I, I'm not sure which group is that. So, there is another one is room one yang sebenar. <laughs> so, maybe I, I want to call for those who are actually in room one yang sebenar tu, maybe you can share a bit um, uh, what is your, 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 your findings from your discussion. Uh, just one rep. Can you unmute microphone and then uh, share with us uh, what you have discussed? Hi, my name is uh, Amy. I'm from uh, the Faculty of Computer Science. Um, mm -hmm. My experience is that um, because I consider my students to have low bandwidth and also to help them save their stuff, so I told them not to fix on their webcam. Okay. <laughs> because young children, uh, that one is taking a lot of data and I think we need right. to be considerate for the students. Agree. So, um, so I just let them switch off their webcam and mm. also mute themselves when I'm talking. But when I'm doing discussion, or sometimes when I explain, um, I do ask questions or like this. Uh, I think chat box. Uh, whether they respond. Or sometimes some classes are very responsive. Mm. Some are not. So for those yang tak respond, kadang-kadang I feel like I'm talking to a wall. You know, like are they are they you know are they listening to me? Are are they, are they responsive? So um I felt that lah, but um when when I felt that I also remind I will post my 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 teaching and I will tell them that I appreciate if they respond to me lah. Either they want to type in the chat box, so sometimes they are shy or they are more introvert or maybe they malas, so they just type in the text box. Uh, ataupun sometimes they will unmute themselves and talk lah after I remind them. So I think that's the best that I can do at this point in time lah. Okay, alright. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amy. Um, maybe I can have some sharing from this room three. Um, anybody would like to share something from the discussion? I think when I visited this room, is quite lovely just now. Maybe Dr. Ashley, you want to say something? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, um, I guess the party, uh, uh, what we were discussing is uh, participation, basically. Okay. Uh, and um, and uh, I I tend to find that um, on online teaching the participation is slightly better than face to face. Okay. Um, Interesting. So yeah, probably because uh, the interaction is not there, physical interaction. So they are they are more willing to talk to the screen uh, rather than to talk to you. All right. Um, but um, having said that. Um, the the students are still the same uh, the, it's the same all every time you have a class the same students are the one who voluntary voluntarily yeah. uh, uh, answer your question or even have something to ask um so how to overcome that is uh, basically you go back to the the same thing that you do in the physical class you no know? you call out their names uh, I, I guess what else uh, can we do uh, okay. I, I call it like chabutan uh, bertua no so um, so that's what they get to get now. So um, other than that, um, the connectivity problem is definitely an issue. Um, I guess just like how our friend from uh, computer science uh, was mentioning earlier. Um, mm -hmm. The thing is that how do you overcome this? And uh, um, we in the medical faculty, we have a, a problem based learning, which is a small group where only 10 students participate with one instructor. Right. And uh, during the time, uh, even we have an Internet problem. What, what the students do is that um we we already planned if the student cannot interact directly on the uh online communication platform let's mm -hmm. see whether it's uh, teams or webex or zoom um what the student will do is that they'll go immediately to the whatsapp group and they will put their ideas in the whatsapp group and one of these students will actually transfer that to directly and discuss uh whatever this uh, discussion that need to be done based on that so WhatsApp helps. Uh, definitely, WhatsApp helps. It's much uh, easier to interact with that. Um, th that's about it. I think these are the common things that we have in everyday class. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Dr. Tazli, I just want to mention something. Uh, this is my personal opinion. Um, the thing is that um, introducing a new technology to students is definitely a challenging. I, yeah. I rather stick with, stick with something that they are familiar. And I'm also familiar, you know? If if I'm trying it out there the first time, uh, it's definitely going to be a mess, uh, mess, and and I really don't like. I'm comfortable. I'm in my comfortable zone, no, uh, and I, I like to just do what 
what I I'm because uh, sometimes we overdo things and we go into uh, using too many technology platforms mm -hmm. and uh, too many tools and makes the whole learning experience very sour. Right. That's my personal opinion. Lah. So I stick with what I know. <laughs> Right. Okay, that's I understand. Personal understand. Opinion. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Because um, I also I also stick to similar principle as you. Because for example, like for me, I never want to use a lot of tools in my class. So most of the time, um, previously, I, whenever that I conducted any session or training whatsoever, I only use either uh, maximum out of um, maximum tools is only three. The first one, perhaps I'll be using a lot of um, Mentimeter. So that everybody can participate um, in during the session, the polls and so on. Um, and then the second one is actually if like say I would like to encourage for breakout. So I would use together, couple it together with um, with Canva because um, I wanted uh, the students, at least they have some output to be shared here. Even actually uh, in Canva themselves, for example, if they say they have something, they, they are writing down on a piece of paper, they can still take a picture and upload and share it here. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the thing that um, I, I got used to. And finally, um, sometimes I use Padlet. Padlet is mostly just for them to share their own reflection. That's all. Um, those are the things that I played around and, and repeated it. And I agree with you. I mean, uh, of course, if you are not comfortable to use a new tool, um, unless you feel that it is deemed necessary for you to explore into a new tool, then then, then do it. But if let's say the current tool that you have, um, which is engaging enough with the student, then that is sufficient. I mean, you don't have to actually um, use a lot. For example, like this week you're using uh, this tool, next week you're using another different tool. That's that's going to be a bit confusing as well as it's going to be difficult for you to gather, collect all the data that, that you need, um, you know, for your teaching documentation, right? Uh, yeah. I, I, I honestly uh, signed up for your uh, this particular workshop is uh, the, the title is really engaging. That's the reason I joined up you now because I, I realized uh, when you use too many different tools uh, and, the, and the anxiety that you put on to your students. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I myself, if I go to a new workshop where I do not know anything about it, I'm trying to put myself in their shoe. Uh, yeah. The experience and the, the mental uh, um, problems that you're going to get now. Uh, is something that uh, really uh, challenging, la, challenging. Right. And, and and I'm just promoting now. Uh, calm, like what you say is very calm. Uh, I'm I'm promoting for calm. The thing is that I find that Elip, uh, our our Moodle platform, uh, has got many tools that are being underexplored. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to uh, even trying to sell that to my uh, faculty colleagues, you know, to to say that no, there are tools here. Let's try using that, and then try to master these. Uh, rather than going and hunting for uh, tools out there, no. And right. whatever you find out there is already there in the, in uh, in the platform. And uh, and I'm myself, I'm exploring it, no. And I'm right. trying to promote everyone to use that. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Natasha. Okay, All right, thank you. Um, so we also have some output from I think room room six only one. Uh, how to communicate on the same wavelength, same wavelength as the student? I think this is a challenge. And um, and the, the the question is actually whether to reduce materials into small chunks and link it to pop quizzes. Um, yes, I think um, when you mentioned about the small chunk, that is also possible because um, chunking it down, chunking things down, doesn't mean that you are spoon feeding the student. It means that you are scaffolding the students. Of course, you cannot repeat at the same time um, the, the same thing over and over again. If let's say, for example, you have scaffolded the students enough. Um, because you know, I'll, I'll be sharing with you a little bit uh, about scaffolding afterwards. But when we are actually um, giving tasks to students, sometimes students we we think that it is um, we think that is actually challenging enough for the student. It's good to give something that is challenging for the student, but we do not simply just dump it to the student. Sometimes we need to chunk it down. Chunk it down. It helps actually students to think through about it and then be able to build up their competency throughout uh, the chunk um, process, the chunk uh, task. Okay, so that, that is also possible things that we can do. Um, the challenge in room four that I would like to highlight here is cannot see student expression and lack of student participation. Uh, so how they overcome it is to fix rules and expectation of lecturer in class, plan activities that follow students' internet connectivity. This is also very important. Uh, 
uh, plan activities that involve everyone in class and plan activities such as polling, mentimeter, and chat. Um, which is, I think this is, I'm going to highlight later on lah in, in my um, slides. Okay. So thank you for you, from all of you to be sharing about what you have gone through. When we ask ourselves, why do we need to be engaged? Uh, this is actually the reason why. Because um, from the research mixed by Professor John Biggs, showing that if, let's say, we are actually doing passive work, which is just entirely a lecture, we make a big gap between academically inclined students as well as non-academically inclined students here. So when we put staff which is more active, uh, there is an active approach inside the class, even though it is being done online. So what we're trying to do is actually to close the gap between um, non-academically inclined and academically inclined students. So what actually that caused the disengagement of the students? Huh? This is also something that we have to be familiar with. When we actually emphasizing too much on behavioral engagement instead of cognitive engagement, that makes the students being disengaged with us. Uh, for example, like um, we we treat it like a class, like a, a, a normal, uh, for example, primary school or secondary school class. Again, if you have you have to come to my class, otherwise I'm going to penalize you. I'm going to punish you. So, for example, that 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 kind of way, what we call as behavioral engagement, we want to discipline them um, because this is where actually the students they they are not staying together. They are not being in our class right now. They are actually at their own zone. Their own their their they are at actually their own space. So uh, doing so, it doesn't, it won't make things work, okay? Um, for example, like I was told to attend, and when the students say I was told to attend to left session, otherwise it will affect my grade. This is what we call as behavioral engagement. So uh, what does it mean by cognitive engagement is actually um, when the students wanted to explore more uh, instead of just depending on what actually that we're giving them. For example, we are actually giving them a lecture, giving them some um, some new things, and the students be able to relate something which is beyond than what we actually have taught them. That, that means that the students are cognitively engaged. But when we are still using a lot of behavior engagement, it means that um, the, the performance, the students will not be cognitively engaged. Okay, uh, Even, for example, if let's say the student said, I came to the session because I was forced to, for example, uh, another issue is actually when we have a lack of emotional attachment. For example, when we are not addressing the student, we are not um, make we are not actually preparing the room for the student um, to feel safe in the class. For example, or um, one of the way is actually that making us um, that making feel students a bit unsafe is actually when we start to ask questions straight away to them. For example, like, okay, um, Amy, what's the answer right now? Immediately you ask question, you ask the answer. Of course, um, he will, he or she will straight away say that, sorry, sir, my microphone doesn't work <laughs> because um, he, he is actually frozen, frozen because you ask coldly to him to, or to her. So um, in a way that actually we should allow for the student to have some time for them to think through uh, for them to actually interact with each other. And after that, they're going to feel um, safe to actually answer to us any kind of um, question that you throw to them. For example, if let's say the, the student's reflection said, my teachers just teach nonstop or I barely know my teacher and friends here. Of course, this is what happened because when you do it online, especially for the first year student, they never meet with each other uh, and come into the university and they, they do not know who. So it's always a good time for us actually to prepare the group, like putting them in a team building, even though it is being done online, so that they can connect, so that they can um, get to know each other better. One of the way to do so is actually, um, for example, if let's say you are you keep doing breakout session, I would actually encourage you that the breakout is a permanent group. For example, like um, you set up a group from early semester. Uh, four to five of them in one semester. And then whenever that you do breakout, it is actually within the same group. So that it makes them feel comfortable and they can perform better. Rather than every week we actually change group, uh, automated session, you know, uh, change group. We, we feel that we want them to meet with each other, but actually it just increases the social anxiety. Okay, they, they feel anxious a bit more actually, especially for those who 
who never have been interacting with people, they, they feel going to be a bit more anxious in that. So you want to make sure that you set up a permanent group from early and then let them know each other. So most of the time, uh, mix it up with a lot of, uh, sometimes every, at least every class, there, there will be some breakout session, even though it's just a small time, so that they can get along better um, and, and discuss the, 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 the problem that you give to them. Um, there are also other problems that cause um, the disengagement, for example, unsuitable gadgets, um, educators who are lack of skills to create instructional videos or learning content. Sometimes when we make the learning content is too long, for example, we just dump it with like one hour content, uh, which is not suitable for them sometimes. So we need at least to learn um, some cut and trim uh, of the video. If like if you are actually doing some uh, asynchronous session, uh, giving them videos, for example, make sure that um, cut it down, uh, trim it between five to eight minutes per session, for example. So that's how we can ensure that the, um, the students have, the students do not feel overwhelmed actually when they have one hour chunk, uh, that, that's what mean, what is mean by chunking down. When they see it's actually one hour video, so they will actually feel overwhelmed. They will feel overwhelmed uh, because they need to cover those one hour video as part of the lecture. So try to chunk it down. And in between that, um, of course, you can actually give some kind of pop quizzes uh, so that they can um, test the understanding. There are lots of tools for that as well. Uh, you can also use Mentimeter, you can also use Socrative. Uh, there are many tools. Uh, I don't want to touch about the tools, but also you can actually just ask them uh, in the class, for example. So, uh, but, but most importantly is um, whenever that they go through certain videos or uh, that you give to them, um, make sure you have some formative assessment just to test the understanding. Uh, students lack of skills in digital content development. That's also one of the challenge because most of the time uh, we feel that the students know how to do it. Again, we have to realize that maybe students just know just know how to become a user, but but not as a creator. So perhaps we need to provide some kind of scaffolding for them. Um, maybe a class, uh, uh, just as if let's say you cannot find a class, some videos for them to learn about uh, creating content or creating. Um, or, or for example, most of the time I heard that students were complaining that they will they were asked to actually to prepare videos to prepare videos all the time. And um, but bear, but but you have to know that some of the students even didn't know how to edit or create video. Um, so we need to provide them with necessarily support um, so that they be able to grab the skill. And another one, the last one is ineffective online learning experience. This is also because of the students. Uh, when, when the students have a past history that um, that is actually not very good for them, uh, when they, they feel that uh, entering previous classes was not good, they will have that kind of sentiment. Uh, being in an online class will be a much more taxing and burdening to them. So we need to provide a different kind of experience from time to time, just to make sure that they are enjoying our class. So that this is, Part of the reasons that's what caused this engagement among among the students. So what could be done then? Um, I discovered that there are actually three important things that we could do. The first one is actually the eye catching and understandable contents, uh, which means that whenever that you want to create um, slides, it should not be too much wordy. For example, uh, those are the things that we have to be that have to be taken into consideration. The second one is actually impactful pedagogies, uh, and the third one is actually to create a meaningful learning experience for them. But before we actually going through different kind of um, what do you call that? Um, before we actually uh, going into the pedagogical part, we need to know some of the guiding principle in order for us to make sure that our teaching and learning are meaningful inside our class. The first one is actually we look at the uh, First guiding principle is the constructive alignment. I think this is quite popular among the higher education um, because this is always being emphasized by MQA about constructive alignment. But constructive alignment, again, it is not only just for documentation being part. It has to be realized. It has to take place. Because if you're not doing, what, what does it mean by constructive alignment here is, in our teaching and learning session, there must be three elements, important elements. The first one is the learning outcomes. 
okay, which actually that we have crafted in our uh, lesson plan and so on with many um, beautiful verbs that we have highlighted, for example, like to be able to identify, to be able to create something, to be able to analyze on something. So that is actually our, um, our, our aim. Okay, our intended outcome. We want to make sure that the students are having uh, those kind of skill, for example, once they've completed our class. So usually we test them. Okay, after that we test them. We put in the assessment. We put in the assessment in a way that the students need to be able to analyze on something, need to be able to create something, need to be able to compare or evaluate on something. So that's what we do whenever that we, we conduct the assessment because we want to make sure that our learning outcome is being measured. But most of the time, what we fail to do is actually to make sure that the teaching and learning activities also containing those kind of verbs. We need to activate the verbs. Okay. For example, if let's say our intended outcome to make sure that the students be able to analyze on something. Okay. So the teaching and learning activities has also to fulfill that kind of verb. They must, the students must be able to analyze on something instead of just uh, listening to our lecture. Okay, so for example, if let's say your 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 learning outcome is so so that the student be able to explain or to be able to apply, there must be some kind of activity to be done inside our class so that is actually aligned with the learning outcome and also aligned with the assessment. Okay, so that is why uh, it is very important to make sure that all of these three elements are aligned with each other. Okay, uh, that that that's that's um the first guiding principle. The second guiding principle is actually what we call as how people learn framework. Uh, this framework is a study made by J.D. Bransford uh, in the year 2000. He actually studied more than 1,000 uh, research work on effective learning and uh, from, from kindergarten until adults. Okay, So he came up with these four lenses, uh, which means that these four lenses have to be interconnected with each other. The first one is what we call as knowledge-centered where actually the students, uh, the knowledge outcomes of the student, for example, um, in order for us to teach new things for the student, new knowledge for the student, it has to be related with the past knowledge, past knowledge that they have, okay? Interconnect with it. And also the students need to know what is the application of the knowledge. So this is very essential in order for us to teach something new for the student. Um, so that's why it is it, whenever that we are actually teaching them some concepts, some theories and so on, it has to be relatable. It has to have some kind of analogy that makes sense to them. It then And the, the students need to see what is the relationship between this particular theory with whatever that they are, they have been learning before and what, how they're going to apply it in the future. That is uh, on uh, what we call as knowledge centered. The second one is learner centered. So what is actually learner centered is when actually we need to address the learner's background, their misconceptions, their preconception, and um, we make connection to the real life context. Uh, what we can highlight from here is uh, whenever that the students, okay, come into our class. So first of all, we need to identify them. Uh, what background, where, where they're coming from. For example, that for this semester, maybe we are doing something. For next semester, it doesn't mean that we have to repeat whatever that we have done similarly like this semester. Because the student's background can be different. Maybe next semester, there will be more students who are actually having trouble with um, connectivity. So we need to find ways to teach them according to their needs. Um, for example, like they have they, we need to use low bandwidth um, tools, for example, not the same as this week, uh, this semester. Maybe this semester we are facing with the student who doesn't have any problem with the internet connectivity, for example. So we cannot just simply repeat whatever that we have done in the past. We have to make some kind of assessment to them. Not only about that, we also need to assess what are their learning style, for example, so that uh, we do not uh, only address to one group. We need to make sure that uh, it is a balanced way of teaching them. Okay, that is about learner center. The third one is what we call as assessment center. Assessment center here means that the students need to reflect on the learning, learning goals from time to time. So they need some kind of feedback from time to time. If let's say we just stick to giving them some kind of assessment and only, them, uh, only give them the marks towards the end of the semester, 
that means the assessment center is not being fulfilled. Here, what it means here uh, is the students need to be regularly uh, given feedback so that they can see whether they have understood uh, the, the things that they learn or not. Um, so it doesn't mean that we give them a graded assessment, which is, we call it summative assessment, but most of the time, sometimes inside the class, we can do what, what we call as formative assessment. Formative assessment, as simple as, the simplest thing that we can do is actually, for example, if you have ever heard about think, pair, and share activities, that is actually part of the formative assessment. What we can do is actually when we give them the, we give them, um, for example, like a question that they need to answer, instead of calling names straight away, what you can do is actually give them time to think about it and then ask them to participate in a breakout session so that they can talk to each other and share the answer. And then after that, they share answer with everyone. And you don't have to actually, um, you during that time, you can call names because they already have been discussed inside the breakout session and they'll be able to share it out. Okay. Instead of straight away, you put question and then ask names, that is not the best way how we can ensure the student participate because the next time he might feel, he might just say that, no, uh, my microphone will not work. Okay. But um, that is actually the what we call a formative assessment because when the students go through that particular process, after that, they will be able to discuss it and then you will be able to give feedback whether what they are discussing is correct or actually it needs some kind of improvement. So that's the third slant. The final lens is what we call as community centered. Community center is where actually the students need to feel safe. They need to feel uh, related. They need to be, they need to, to connect. They need to connect with each other, not only between students and the instructor, but also between the students and the students. So that, um, and the reason being why, for example, like most of the time we got a message from the student privately. You will understand that sometimes the student will come to you near the exam, they will just text you, sir, can you please explain about this? I don't understand. And they will, un they will ask you privately. That's, be that's the reason uh, because the students do not feel enough to actually throw the question in the WhatsApp group or the Telegram groups. So we need to make sure that the student can connect with each other. So, uh, and, and they would only not dependent on us, but they can also positively be dependent to their friends, the team members as well. So that's the idea of having um, this kind of four lenses. Need. It need to be there together to make sure that the learning become meaningful. It's not only like pick only one, but all of these four lenses, need, it has to be together. Uh, only then our students can be able to learn effectively well. And the last guideline here is what we call as scaffolding. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, scaffolding. So whenever that we want to make sure that the student achieve something, we cannot just simply dump things to them. Because if let's say we just give them assignment, for example, a group project in week three, and we expect them to um, submit in week 14 without checking the progress, for example, that is where actually the student will just maintain at their individual level. They are not actually having uh, what we call as assisted level. Assisted level means that sometimes from time to time we need to check on their progress, for example. Sometimes from time to time, whenever they ask questions to us, instead of we give them answers straight away, we need them to think in order for them to get the answer. So we actually probe them with some kind of question. Or maybe we can give cues, we can give hints, for example. So that is actually what we call as part of the scaffolding. So whenever that we give scaffolding, Okay, for example, uh, some of the students may need three to four steps in order for them to reach the learning outcome. Some of the students may need 15 to 20 steps in order to do so. So whenever that we derive our teaching and learning uh, activities or we conducted some kind of assessment to our student, make sure that this particular student, th this particular activities or the assessment become a stepping uh, become become the ladders for the students to climb in order for them to reach the learning outcomes. Instead of just dumping, okay, because I need to fulfill my assignment, so I give the assignment to, to you. I, I need to fulfill my quota because as a lecturer, I need to prepare three assignments, four tests, and so on. But instead of doing so, you have to think carefully about, okay, 
when whenever that I do this kind of activities, what kind of scaffolding that I can provide to the student? If I'm doing this kind of assessment, what kind of learning uh, scaffolding that I can provide to the student? These are what we have to think to make sure that the students are being supported or being scaffolded while they are learning. When the word scaffolding comes in, it doesn't mean that it has to be permanent. Okay, kalau dalam if it uh, let's say we talk about civil engineering, for example, uh, scaffolding means that before prior to us to 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 erect a main permanent building, we put scaffolding, and then so that it become uh, uh, it is intact, and then after that we take it up. So similarly here in learning here, whenever that we put scaffolding to the student, once we feel that the student have reached the level that we want them to be, then that is where actually we take it up. So it doesn't mean that. Maybe in week one or week two, we provide some kind of chunk task. Once the students are okay, then the chunk become a bit bigger, okay, instead of like much, much more smaller chunks. So that is how actually we provide that kind of a scaffolding to support uh, the students' learning. On top of that, okay, whenever that we want to make sure that the students are cognitively engaged, we have to make sure that we um, understand about the words of empathy. Okay, um, uh, empathy is very important. Uh, I think from the sharing that you have shared with me in terms of whenever during the breakout activities, uh, most of you are trying to put yourself in the student's shoes, which is good uh, because that is what we want. What is the students gonna feel safe and they're gonna feel happy in learning in our class when we are empathizing them. For example, in terms of the duration of the assignment, sometimes um, maybe in the past during the physical classes, when they are actually at the university, it's easier for, for us to give them assignment. Okay, within the three days, you can just submit. But when they are actually away from us, they are at their own zone, at their own space, we need to think about what are other things that they need to do in order for them to complete the assignment. Maybe they need some kind of assistant, but at the same time, maybe they are at home doing some other chores, helping their parents, for example. So these are the things that we have to put in our mind uh, before we, we, we decided to give them some kind of assignment or assessment or test and whatsoever. Uh, so that's why it is very important for us to, to try to develop empathy skill, empathetic skill in ourselves, uh, because this is a learned habit. Uh, it is not something that comes naturally to us, but um, and, and, and we have to make sure that we learn about empathy um, because um, uh, by, by actually starting, with, starting from us, we need to make sure that first of all, we manage our own emotion, okay? Because those who actually fail to manage their own emotion, they cannot acquire empathy. So first thing first is actually manage our own emotion, learn how to manage our own emotion, then we can learn about uh, empathy itself. But empathy, it is not about being pitiful or it is not about being kind. It is actually making decision, okay? Whenever that we want to make decision in ensuring the learning progress happen, it's taking, taking into consideration about our students. That is actually what is empathy is all about. It guides our action. Whenever that we have empathy, it guides our action. Why do we need empathy? Of course, um, during this pandemic, that you know that um, everybody of us, we are actually in a different boat. Maybe uh, it is in the still the same typhoon or the same tsunami, for example, but some of us may be in a very comfortable ship. Some of us, maybe our students are just in a sampan or using racket, for example. So it's a different condition, okay? We are not in the same boat. So that is why we need to try to understand our student first, going back to HPL framework, right? Learner-centered, we need to ascertain about their background. We need to know about the student's background. Then only then we can decide how does the teaching and learning can be effective in our class. When we talk about spectrum of student-centered learning, okay, this is one way that we can ensure that um, the students are cognitively engaged in our class. So uh, there are many ways, many pedagogical approaches that we can actually tackle, use, but make sure that it is constructively aligned. That's number one. 
because sometimes we can say that oh we are using uh, i'm using in my class i'm using flip classroom i'm using for example problem based learning for example um and and but then we do not know actually what's the purpose of using that uh, and yet it is not constructively aligned for example like uh, if we want to use problem based learning usually it is the idea of using problem based learning just to nurture critical thinking teamwork um, problem solving skills and and many other things but our intended learning outcome is for the student just to be able to explain on something or very low level according to bloom taxonomy to it's just a low level uh, low level uh, activities for example that we want to achieve so having said that putting problem based learning is just taxing and exhausting for the students so we want to actually reconsider if let's say our intended learning outcome is something like to be able student maybe up to level of apply for example um, and then in the assessment also it's just application but we don't go to the doing something that is exhausting for the students and and taxing for them perhaps doing active learning or collaborative learning is sufficient but if let's say we really aim to develop teamwork in our in our class for example so perhaps cooperative learning is the way forward so that it, that's why it is it is very important for us to really understand uh, the pedagogical approaches that we want to use it has to be aligned with um with what we intend to do with what we intend the students to achieve uh, that is that is very important and for those who actually just started for example like they used to be making uh, what we call it as physical classroom be, uh, it's like much um what do you call it um they, they they are they are so used to traditional way before chalk and talk before uh not there is no interaction with the class and so on and suddenly because um because of they want to make change they jump straight away to do a a, a high-ended um the high end of the student-centered learning approach for example here the high end here is what we call as problem-based learning they never got the facilitation skill they never learn about how to develop the case study for example but they are very ambitious straight away to jump to do this these are also something that i do not advise because um it won't only cause trauma for the student but it's also will be traumatizing the, the lecturers themselves so that is why it is very good we need also to scaffold ourselves start with something small and regularly grow up and and from for example start with uh, active learning first and then we can go moving into flip classroom collaborative learning and so on so we don't simply start with something that is big is huge um until we really learn and and prep ourselves to become better similarly with tools for example if let's say you just started using some kind of tools maybe you want to use those kind of tool first for a few times and see the feedback from the student reflect on it um and and get reflection from the students and after that we can improve from time to time maybe you want to okay now i've i figured out there may be some other tools that is much more suitable that i could use to meet my intended outcome for example only then we switch to it otherwise if let's say we feel comfortable with this and it it, it actually constructively align to our intended outcome so just stick to it there's no no reason for us to actually switch here and there So when we talk about active learning, what is it actually? Um, when we ask for the student to participate in the discussion, giving talk, giving presentation, doing the role play and so on, those are the things that what we call as active uh, way. But it doesn't mean that active learning, you have to allow the students to, you know, um, role play in front of the computer. It doesn't, have, it doesn't mean like that. When we talk about active learning, what, for example, if let's say you still have conducted a lecture, we have, for example, one hour lecture, for example. So what we can do is actually we can slot in some activities in between of the lecture. I know that some of us have a tendency to actually um, do like this. For example, I just want to complete one hour lecture and then I'm going to give another one hour for activities. What happened is that the story feel exhausted for that one hour listening to the lecture. And sometimes they not be able to get everything to get everything out, uh, and then need, uh, and then they wanted to, to solve the the final part, which is the one hour activities. So instead of giving that one hour activities in a two hours class, what we can do is actually we need to chunk it down. We chunk it down. 
we chunk it down and we put some small activities in between of the lecture. So that is, um, that, that is how it can help the students to think through about the content that we are teaching them instead of like expecting them to know everything and solve the activities towards the end. So this is where actually what we call as book and model. So the book and model, it helps actually, first of all, uh, we need to have advanced organizing. Advanced organizing in a way that we need to ascertain what the students know with what we are going to teach them. It is not a lecture here, but it's kind of activities. For example, like um, if you remember the question that I threw to you just now at the start of it, for example, like how many of you have been using Mentimeter, Canva, and so on. That is kind of the technique of what we call as advanced organizing because you wanted them to, you wanted to know about their knowledge, their previous knowledge. So you, you throw some question and you ask them to participate in doing some kind of activities. So that's what we call as advanced organizing. And then along the way of the lecture, we, we, we stop for a while and then we do some kind of activities in between just to make sure that the, student, the students stay tuned to, um, to us. And then we can continue with the lecture. Okay. And then after that, we also again conducted, if you have time, then we can conduct another intermittent activities. And then we continue with our lecture and then finally we do some kind of closure. So the closure means that uh, it doesn't mean that we have to do, what do you call it? Um, it doesn't mean that we are actually just debriefing everything. Closure can also be some kind of activities. For example, like students write down reflection, students write down question that they still, not, still do not understand. So you can address them in the next class, for example. So these are the activities that we can do and this is what we call as active learning experience. Okay, perhaps I would like to ask you a question here. Okay, uh, if we go to Mentimeter. Why there is a need for advanced organizer, intermittent discussions, and closure in our typical lectures? Can you explain, can you share with me why do you think that there is a need for advanced organizer, intermittent discussion, and closure in our typical lectures? So please share in Mentimeter. The link is, uh, I have given the link there. You can click the link and share your thoughts about it. To better guide student learning, preparedness, engagement with student, summarize what we have done. Okay. Preparedness, engagement with student, summarize what we have done. Take home message. Organize it as a plan, discussion to get feedback, closure to recap what we thought during the lesson. Okay, it's good. What else? Why do you think that, okay, for engagement and active learning, okay. There's always a reason for us actually, when we call that kind, that, that term, right? Uh, advanced organizer, intermittent discussion, closure. Um, there's always a reason uh, why we are doing that. Um, it's not simply just, um, just because we wanted to do it, but there's always a reason for that. Untuk menghasilkan proper structured lessons selain dari achieve outcome, visualize and construct ideas or information, okay, and for engagement, okay. So, so kalau kita tengok, it is not only for the purpose of engagement. Okay? It is not only for the purpose of engagement. Why we're doing this is actually to make sure that um, whenever that, for example, that when, when we do the um, uh, intermittent discussion, for example, most of the time, uh, the retention of the students will actually start to drop down from time to time. So when we have some kind of question, we ask them to individually construct about it. And then after that, we need them to interact with each other in a breakout session. And after that, we do the overall class, class sharing. This is where actually the students will be having uh, what we call as um, uh, the, the retention we maintain. Okay, that's number one. Second one also is about feedback. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's about formative assessment. So whenever that we throw some question to the students and ask the student to participate and discuss about it, that is where actually the student will be, give, will be given some kind of feedback, whether what they are discussing is right or wrong. Ataupun, um, we can also use this kind of technique just to make sure that um, the students will be able to summarize and see any loophole that they are not sure about. Uh, some other activities that can be used, apart from just now I shared about think, pair and share. I can also, um, we can also give, for example, cooperative notes taking. 
note taking eh, if you have heard about that for example like you ask the student give them reminder daripada awal okay um after 10 or 15 minutes after the lecture you want to check their notes for example so what we can do is actually uh, after 10 to 15 minutes we stop for a while and then we ask them to swap notes with each other so when they are swapping notes uh, everyone their partner will actually just top up, top up some notes um, to make sure that the students um, and then they can actually summarize what they have learned together so those kind of activities could be done inside the class or another way if let's say you think that the students have difficulties or challenge to read something which is much more scientific or complex material for example we can always do reading in pairs uh, activities um, for example like the students uh, when when for example you complete a lecture and then you have an activity some articles need to be read maybe only one paragraph or two paragraph articles need to be read so you ask them to read and 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 uh, each and everyone maybe take one paragraph each uh, within four members in a group and then whenever that they complete the reading and they take turn to explain to each other what they understand from their reading and they summarize it and they share in the class so that's also something that could be done to support um in terms of what we call as active learning so it doesn't need um uh, an expensive for example um alat bantuan mengajar you don't need that um you is it's just a method that we need to plan it and complete some kind of activities in between okay all right um another approach that we can do um is is what we call as um this is actually one of the <clears throat> innovation that i have introduced um, this is much more complicated like complex okay, compared to just doing active learning alone um the students for example like um this is where actually i introduced it in 2016 the students was given some kind of material for them to go through like watching the videos answer the quizzes provided um, or given problems so that they can try to solve it in advance individually so this is actually individual tasks which been given to the student pre-class um, this is where kalau equivalently dengan keadaan sekarang uh, where the students are not be able to come to real class okay where they're coming to online class what we can do is actually we can allow them to watch some kind of videos prior to the uh, the, the, the live session the live class okay the synchronous punya class we can do this as part of asynchronous activities so all of those low level uh, we call it low order thinking skills kind of activities it could be done individually where the students may be able to actually uh, do watch some videos write down notes prepare mind maps for example so they can do the do this on their own individually and then um, after that when they come to the class the first thing that they could do is actually they can do some kind we can do some kind of polling we can do some kind of mentimeter activities for example think pair share uh, or combine mind map for example or actually checking each other's mind map and top up some data some information then this is what we call as recap session and then after that when they come uh, after they completed the recap which means that they have recap whatever that they have watched in their videos and so on we can actually conduct some uh, detailed much more deeper activities inside our class so instead of we spend our time in the live session class ni, in the synchronous session class ni, we instead of we spend our time doing lecture uh, one hour straight or two hours why not we change it into a much deeper activities which allow the students to participate in the breakout and, and solve some problems or actually doing some uh, detailed activities that, that uh, and, and yet they, make, they need to make some kind of presentation later on. So that is much more meaningful for the student who have um, less data, for example, um, in terms of the connectivity, they have a problem, for example, because uh, that is where actually the students may be able to participate in their own way some students maybe can use telegram group in order for them to solve the problem and then after that they can come back to us and make the presentation some students they may be able to participate in the breakout that we provide to them but um, this is how um, we can cognitively engage the students inside the class rather than just a typical lecture 
Uh, so uh, only then it makes sense for them to come regularly to our class because they know that there will be some kind of activities. If let's say they are missing it, which means that they may not know, be able to know in the detail of the topics that we are discussing. And finally, whenever that we have the session, find, complete the session and we can have reflection. So what I usually did is actually for this activity to be conducted, I make sure that it is being done in the similar group, in the same group, uh, so that the students are gel up together, they are bonded together, uh, they, are, they, are, they, they are socially connected with each other. So what I did also um, in the first class too, selalunya I did mini team building, where actually um, we share the expectation of um, what they're going to achieve within that semester. And after that, we do some kind of personality and learning style profiling. So this helped me to do the grouping for the students. Because um, usually when I conduct it, I do the grouping for the student, I do it on my own rather than I allow the students to pick themselves, uh, pick, pick friends in the, for the groups. Because uh, here I would like them to learn to get connected to a bigger network other than, their, and other than their own friends. So when they are actually connected to a bigger network, later on they'll be able to, to, to know not only their team members within that group, but also to know the friends from the friends of the friends and so on. Okay, so whenever that I, I group them together, I consider a few things, for example, like what's their performance, the team performance, individual performance versus team performance. For example, like um, those with CGPA 2.5, of course, I'm not going to put them together with those with CGPA of 4.0. Um, I'll make sure that uh, even the less uh, I don't because I don't want the students who are actually having this 2.5 grade feel intimidated with those who are actually uh, with 4.0 student and and I don't want the 4.0 student feel that 2.5 student becoming their liability so in a way that uh, whenever that I conducted I make sure that the, I do the grouping so the grouping maybe with those 4.0 the lowest that I put in maybe 3.1 or 3.2 and those with uh, below than three, I'm gonna uh, I put them in a separate group, uh, so that I can give extra scaffolding for this group, rather than you know you have to monitor all the group. And you know that the group with those 4.0, 3.9 students, perhaps they they need only a small amount of scaffolding in comparison to those who are actually uh, having a much more lower CGPA. But at the same time, I also look into the personality. For example, like uh, if you have done some kind of personality test or something like that, it helps in a way that um, it, you can classify the students according to different kind of personality. Because I want the students to learn that different people will have a different way they deal with things. For example, like um, there will be some students who are actually uh, an extrovert uh, in comparison to an introvert person. So I would like them to know that there is a difference in the way how uh, people deal and make decision, for example, and they can respect, learn how to respect each other uh, in doing so. And of course, uh, for example, like if let's say in terms of the gender, I'll make sure that uh, there's only, uh, let's say there is a team of four students. Uh, once, I, I'll make sure if let's say there is a girl inside that, that group, it shouldn't be only one, it should be beyond than that lah. Uh, so, kalau, kalau tidak because of the scientific reason pun, selalunya uh, the girl will be forced to become the secretary. So, you want to avoid that and then that's why make sure that in terms of the gender is being balanced as well. Um, in terms of the, uh, if you are, we are concerned about uh, the racial polarity, also we can also put a different kind of race inside the group, uh, all together with the interna international students. And then along the way, uh, there will be some kind of peer rating and feedback session so that the students are particip so that the students can give feedback to each other uh, about uh, each other's performance inside the class because most of the time whenever that I conducted this what we call as in class activities it is being done in as a group as a group activity so that the students uh, can give feedback to each other and also they can give peer rating not only towards the end of the semester but they are giving peer rating from time to time. For example, if let's say the activity is being conducted for one semester, perhaps two or three times of peer rating session so that the students can learn about improving the teamwork skills and so on. Okay.
Um, do you have any question before I proceed? I think this is the the, the final part before I yeah. Can I have some question? You you if you have, want to ask something, because I can go quickly on this. Uh, if you want to get um to to get some some kind of clarification. Doctor, yes. just now we mentioned about if we want to uh, separate group for the students, so and then we have to look into the personality and the learning style of the student. So how it might be, you can provide me uh, some kind of idea. How can we conduct this type of um, assessment? It's it's kind of assessment. So how how can we how can we do that? Um, oh. um, instead of kita just menggunakan Mungkin kita dapatkan dia punya CGPA punya apa ni uh, untuk dia punya previous semester dan sebagainya. Mungkin ada, is there any other ways that we can use in order to do this assessment before we assign them into groups? Oh, okay. Um, there are ways you can do that. There are plenty of personality punya, personality profiling. Um, for, so, means for, we can use the personality profiling lah, doctor. Right. For example, like uh, if you have heard about dope test, uh, dope test ni dove, owl, peacock, eagle punya test tu kan? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, sebab contohnya kalau imagine lah, if let's say you accidentally you put eagle together, all of those four people, four members are eagle, what will happen to the group? Semua jenis bercakap-cakap nanti kan? Because they actually wanted to have um, their own direction. So, uh, and if let's say you imagine you put Duff together kan, uh, so semua burung merpati, uh, semua nak nak jaga hati masing-masing, tak nak buat decision, tak nak takut nak tolak idea orang ni dan sebagainya. So, you may want to allow them to mingle uh, together lah. Especially when I conducted this test, uh, usually eagle tu sangat sikit dalam kelas. I, I don't know, in Malaysia punya context setting, eagle tu sangat sikit. So, you don't want to, you don't want to put the eagle together, you may want to actually split them out. So that they can lead the group. Uh, usually eagle ni dia macam natural born leader lah somehow kan. Dia punya tagline dia just do it. Uh, so that is one, one dog test. Ataupun we can also use personality plus test. Um, uh, I I don't I don't prefer to use the, this M, M, apa, MT, MBTI. My, Myers Brick punya. Hmm, Myers Brick. MBTI is quite complex right? It's very complex. So I don't, I don't prefer to use that. Tapi macam dog and personality plus tu that, that's a good one lah. Pasti plus tu hmm. dia ada macam, dia eh, similar. Dia ada nama dia pragmatic, melancholy, sanguine, hmm. Hmm. something yes. like that. So, so mm -hmm. we can use that one as well. Uh, to. So it's a combination lah. It's not only one way of doing the grouping, but I also combine with uh, different um, different CGPA and so on. So, so normally, and normally this type of assessment, uh, kita boleh, practically we can do in the first class session lah kan, doktor? Ataupun macam mana? Right. Selalunya okay. saya akan minta sebelum start semester tu, uh, always ask the student to res to do the personality plus, uh, personality test, give share with with me their CGPA and so on lah. Jadi hmm, right. that I be able to make uh, grouping. So masa dalam first class lagi, selalunya saya dah start dengan team building. I always conduct with the team building. Alright, thank uh, you, thank you, doctor. Okay, have you ever move or change a student group? For example, the student improve, e.g., the student improve CGPA. Um, I, for example, like most of the time, a student, um, I only move the student only if the student face uh, conflict yang tak boleh dielakkan lagi dalam group dia. Uh, contohnya. So, sometimes you need to know the also the the, the story behind lah. Uh, contohnya ada setengah tu ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend. So, you don't want them to be together lah in a group, you want to try as possible, try to put in them in a different group. <laughs> but, um, but other than that, I don't, so far I don't have any problem lah in term of like, uh, I don't actually haven't disband any group. Most of the time, if let's say the group have problems or conflicts, I will call them up and then try to talk to them what's going on. And we become the mediator lah, just to make sure that um, the, the, the any conflict within the group is resolved. But more important thing, one more important thing that I did in my um, team, uh, in my team building, whenever that the students are in, in the team building, they need to create their names, team names, team logo, tagline and so on. Also including what we call as team charter. Team charter ni is actually their, their, 
pledge lah. The pledge is what are the do and don'ts within the team. So um, whenever that they have conflict, I will ask them to bring together what's the team charter. Sometimes I keep it with me. So I show you out. So actually who's actually not following the rule? Who's actually not following the do and the don'ts ni? So that is why actually we we cons- try to consolidate lah and then try try to uh, mediate the any any kind of conflict. Would this be applicable to both small and large group? Large groups, 100 students or more. Yes, I've been trying to use to do that, but of course, it's not that effective. Kalau contohnya, if let's say you are conducting this kind of session in the online class, of course, you cannot visit all the 20 groups in one go. But what we can do is actually, uh, we can, for example, maybe this session you just visit 10 groups, um, and then the next week, the next session, you can just visit another group that you haven't, visited before so that you can give feedback from them to time to time because now na- na- visit all 20 groups in one go is not possible lah. it's just a waste of time you can not na- make sure that they are actually discussing and and checking on them but um sure um for me i think that is possible but the best one kalau nak buat macam ni about 50 to 60 students i think still applicable lah. we can still use that okay um, I'm going to share with you some of the tips um, so that we can create a meaningful online experience for the students. Um, in general, lah, I'm going to share with you before we end our session here. Uh, tak apa, Dr. Mazina, terlajak sikit. <laughs> okay, eh? No problem. Boleh, boleh, Dr. So, the tips number one is actually to check in terms of their internet accessibility as well as their affordability. Uh, which means that, uh, first, this is always important. Some students they have accessibility to the internet, but they cannot afford that. Some student, they can afford it, but uh, their area tak ada data and so on. So these are the things that we need to check so that we can decide whether, what kind of, uh, whether we're going for low bandwidth activities or whether we're going for uh, upper live session all the time and, and so on. And tips number two is actually to look into uh, synchronizing teaching schedule and student workload. I think this is also something that we have to bear in mind. Uh, sometimes we actually, everybody want the student to achieve teamwork, for example, teamwork skill. So everybody give project to the student. When everybody give project to the student, students are overburdened and overlooked with so many things. And on top of that, they have a different group they have to address. So why not, why not, okay, the lecturers, uh, the educators, importantly, try to synchronize in terms of their assessment, assignments. So that, um, uh, so that it is a manageable workload. Uh, what we did last time when I was in, in UC Petronas, um, in my department, at every time before we start the semester, all the lecturers teaching the same cohort will sit down together and discuss about what kind of integrated project that we're going to do. Because instead of just give them, everybody give project, so it's like being an integrated project where actually it's just one project, but it's a combined, it's a combined different subjects together in it. Number two is actually we're looking at, okay, when is your test? When is my test? When is your assignment due? When is my assignment due? And so on. So we discuss on it. And we put it on, on a calendar. So we know that this particular week, the students need to address, need to do this particular test, and we cannot give them any other assignment just to make sure that it is synchronized well. So I think those are the things that you could do um, at, at, at your own department, at your own program, if let's say the students... Um, have to take, be able to take the same courses. They are the cohort yang sama take the same courses. That that should help the students a lot in managing uh, their workloads, okay? Because I believe in one thing, collaborative educators will produce collaborative students. So if we are actually uh, doing the teaching in silo, of course, we are not showing the right role, role model to the students. Um, tips number three is to blend synchronous and asynchronous um, for example, like you produce pre-recorded lectures on YouTube, chunk it three to eight minutes per video, for example. Or, uh, and, and at the same time, uh, tip number four is we provide the live access for more discussion and activity to strengthen understanding. <clears throat> so give more relatable examples, especially things at home. Because, for example, in my case, I taught uh, chemical engineering students before. Of course, when I describe about distillation column and these students had never been to university before, of course, they cannot imagine what distillation column look like. So sometimes I need to give a relatable example just so that they can imagine, okay, all right, this is something familiar with the distillation column. This is familiar with uh, thermodynamics when I talk about kettle, for example. 
I, I talk about boiling process, for example. So, so we need to be a bit more creative in finding a relatable example to the students. Uh, tip number five is to provide online community support for the students. Uh, for example, like we provide them with WhatsApp or Telegram groups and so on. Um, and therefore, we need to encourage the student also to ask questions uh, in, in the group. Um, or actually what we can do is actually to gamify the experience. So uh, by asking for the, for example, uh, this, the group of students who ask question or answer other people's question, they can get extra point or extra mark for them. Tips number six is actually to provide regular formative assessment. As I mentioned earlier, we don't have to increase the number of assignments to the students, but we can give them a lot of formative assessment just to check on the feedback. Kalau saya, for me, whenever that last time I was given a few portion to, for me to develop the coursework, bagi coursework, and I would, I would always give the coursework only for the things that is necessary. That is very important for me. For example, like, kalau um, setakat quiz yang so, jawab soalan A, B, C, D tu, usually I don't give mark for that. It's just part of the formative assessment, just so that the students can get some, some something. But I always spend that time for them, for example, like, okay, this 10 marks is dedicated for two weeks assignment that they have to do uh, on their own, for example, or they can be doing as a team, for example. So, so only, only assess what is necessary. It doesn't have to be like every week you need to provide assignment for them. Uh, so, so that they are not being overwhelmed with so many assignment, but it is, it is repetitive and there is no meaning. There is no scaffolding happen. So there's no point of giving that kind of assignment. Okay. And tips number seven, uh, again. Uh, doctor, can yeah. I ask something? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, doctor, uh, as an engineering background like yourself or so, yeah. I just want to yeah. check when you come into the assessment, right? Um, as, uh, as you know, in the, we also have an accreditation process. Right. So when we do all this type of, um, assessment, um, mm -hmm. how will we be able to show proof to the, for the accreditation? Is oh, there okay. any comment from your side? Thank you. All right. What you have to do, as I mentioned earlier, whenever that you want to give any kind of assignment or assessment to the student, it has to be constructively aligned. Um, for example, like if let's say you are giving them some kind of um, assessment um, or assignment to them and show that how does that assignment meets the learning outcome and how how actually that you support the student through the activities inside the class with that with that assignment um so as long as you be able to show that it is constructively aligned then there's no issue with it um most of the time what happened in the past is that i i remember some of the lecturers um they just take the assignment from the textbook you know for me there is no since i i came back from my phd there's no more textbook assignment <laughs> i don't give any more assignment based on the textbook because I know that the students can easily get the answer. Students can just go and, and, and get the answer scheme uh, in the in, from the internet. So this is where actually uh, we need to be a bit more creative in looking for more open-ended assessment. Um, there's no longer, uh, even if let's say uh, the, the question can be modified. If let's say you come across doing some kind of close-ended assignment before, uh, which is mean that usually I know that because engineering they have tendency that we give bagi satu soalan, kaki kaki kaki, and then you get the mark, you get the marks, and then you get sorry you get the answer values, and then after that you justify the values, uh, and most of the time you will get similar result. But this is just actually for me that is not scaffolding the student. It's just a matter of like for the sake of giving the assignment, we need to try to give more on open ended assessment. Uh, more problem-based kind of scenario for the students. I think uh, in terms of when we mentioned about assessment, there's going to be a different workshop. Usually, I conducted four hours workshop for this, <laughs> for, for uh, high order thinking skills assessment. Ni. But um, then, then it shouldn't be any problem with uh, accreditation. Because even I, I, I noticed right now, in, term of, in the accreditation also, it heavily emphasizes on the complex problem solving, complex problem solving skills which need to be addressed. So uh, we, we need to try to do more on open-ended kind of assignment uh, for the students. I agree with you that on that, Doctor. Sorry again to interrupt. Um, yeah, but yeah, the, 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 sometimes the challenge is that when we face 
uh, some of the uh, panels which are more on the old school, then there will be another <laughs> another potential discussion heavily discussed during the process. Oh. But if we are looking at forward, like what you mentioned, I do tend to agree with you. Well, however, we are still not sure of. Again, uh, the panels can be varies. They may have their own ways of uh, assessing. So yeah. these are some of the concern that we are always uh, have when it comes uh, into engineering. I, I have done it before, actually. Um, mm. For example, like in 2000, <clears throat> uh, the, when the panel visited and, and asked us about uh, what is the proof of complex problem solving activities that you have done. So during that time, it was the first time that we introduced the integrated project. Integrated project, um, the task that we give to them is actually to design a board game which uh, integrating three subjects together inside it. Uh, one subject is my subject, reaction engineering. There is another one, process safety, process control together, three of them together. And, and, and they need, the students need to develop a board game. So if you can have a look at it, um, that, that board game so is a complex activities because uh, one student or two students cannot simply just do it on their own. It needs um, really effort from the three people. And then they need to decide about what type of board game that they need to use, what kind of question they need to ask, because I, uh, I also emphasize to them that the question must not be a low order thinking skills question. So then they were taught actually about Bloom Taxonomy, about choosing the right guide work, and also to make sure that the, the board game is not too difficult and not too easy for them. Um, I, I can share you the link later on. I have published the work, um, but that kind of work is actually uh, what has been agreed by the panel as one of the complex uh, problem solving activities. So it doesn't mean all the time has to do with the design, but actually you can be a bit more creative in coming, coming out with the assignment. And as I mentioned, uh, importantly, um, try to make sure that our intended learning outcome is being achieved. Um, as long as we can show that uh, there is a link between what we assign to the student and with what we actually uh, give them as part of the learning outcome and it is aligned, then there shouldn't be any question about it actually. And you can contest like, the panel if let's say they, are, they have, uh, <laughs> apa, what do you call that? They, they still have a disagreement on it. Uh, because I know that the, the style is actually, uh, it's not only engineering, but if you notice that, um, there are, what do you call it, I would say the old style, old school of teaching algorithm. Old school of teaching algorithm. It means that it starts first with teaching, lecture, non-stop lecture, followed by um, tutorials, tutorials which is coming from the textbook, or let it to be untuk menyiapkan this, this kind of tutorial, and then let it to be, and then coming up with the question which is almost similar like the tutorial, Maybe just a different values and numbers. This happened not only at the university. It started from schools, actually. And then what ended up that we, 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 <laughs> we produce our students who are actually just good at answering the exam. That's all. We don't actually produce the student with different kind of skills. Uh, but this algorithm is just everywhere, which we need to stop. That's why there is a mushroom of tuition center, all those kind of thing, because the tuition center help the student to drill them uh, better so that they can become a better uh, bet, better at preparing for answering the exam because the exam will will definitely look like the same as what we give them in the tutorial. So uh, right now, um, for the past few years, I have never given I've never given them a set of questions for the tutorial. I always give them more on open ended kind of uh, assessment. Even there is I can use a similar question on the tutorial, but I always ask them to reflect on it to actually to for example, I come up with some other question, for example, what can go wrong with the question or what can go wrong with if let's say things happen like this and that. So they need to discuss over it and think about it. Uh, that somehow needs extra, um, yeah, of course, we need to learn from it, uh, extra training, uh, being extra creative about it. But um, if let's say it's still being contested by the panel, you need to contest. <laughs> you need to contest about it. As long, uh, for me, the, the, the key important thing is actually just to make sure that it is constructively aligned. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, and tips number eight is actually to gamify the experience I mentioned earlier. 
when you want to do gamification, I would recommend you to do what we call as um, group gamification, team-based gamification rather than individual gamification. Why is it so? If let's say we just do individual gamification, only the same group of students will just try to talk each other to be at the top. But when we actually split down, making them as a group uh, competition, that is where actually it will drive other students who have never participated in and, and in, in this kind of competition will be there together. So um, the tip, using cooperative learning is one of the ways that you can help to gamify the experience. Okay, I will explain, um, I think I have to explain a different type of thing, like if, let's say you haven't come across what does it mean by cooperative learning, the difference between cooperative and collaborative learning, it has some difference because in cooperative learning, you need to make sure that you achieve some kind, you, you need to adhere to some kind of principles to make sure that the team is considered as cooperative. And final tips is actually to provide platform for feedback and reflection so that the students can regularly um, share with you their feedback, they can share their reflection. Um, and then most importantly is actually we address back. When they write down the reflection, we give it back to them. Uh, we actually tell them what we have gone through the uh, read, read through the, the reflection and this is what actually that we're going to take action from the reflection. So we show to that that we genuinely care uh, for the students. But um, as I said, uh, although that for example like in, in Zoom or in Webex can go up to 500 students whatsoever, for me, um, the best number of students in an online class should not be than 50. Um, just to make sure that you you maintain the track. But but if let's say there are a large number of students, it needs to be chunked down. Um, you cannot simply just do this kind of activities for 200 students just like that. It, it's not that effective. It's not effective for me. The maximum number, it can go up to 50. So that, um, um, apa? We cannot just simply replicate whatever that we are doing in our physical class with the online class. Maybe in the physical class, we can conduct active learning for 200 students. But it doesn't work that way when actually we are using, when we are using online class. Online class for me, 40 to 50 is a good number. Okay, ada quiz eh? Tak apalah, saya skip lah yang ni. This time, tak sempat. Okay, dah pukul 12.11. Alright, I think um, that's all that I would like to share with you with um, the last quotation here is, the last quote here from Ralph Tyler. Uh, he said that learning takes place through the active behavior of the student. It is what he does that he learns, not what the teacher does. Uh, it is what he does that he learns, which means that the learning only, if let's say the students are active, um, then he learns. If let's say the students are passive, he will not be learning as much as what the active students learn. So it is not what we do, uh, but it is what about the student does. So you can share this lah to, to your student just to motivate them to ensure that they have a, a, a better learning experience. Okay, um, let me bring back you to the final part. Um, before we ended our session, saya nak buat quiz tu tapi tak apalah nantilah. <laughs> tak sempat. Um, Perhaps you can share your own reflection of this workshop with me um, using the Mentimeter link again. So you can, um, this is the final part, you can share your reflection about what have you learned uh, about during this session, uh, what and any any new thing that you have learned, any new, uh, apa, any, Ataupun benda yang sama, um, ataupun actually there is something that you feel that you want to improve in your class. Perhaps you can share uh, as part of your own reflection um, uh, with me. So don't worry about this. This is an anonymous punya reflection. Nobody can see. Uh, nobody knows who write what actually. Kam pun tak tahu kan. Uh, so tak apa. You can just write it down and, and share with everyone here. Uh, meanwhile... Um, on my part, I just want to share with you that uh, in Skola Malaysia, we also have some kind of training um, that we provide for educators. Um, so the training, for example, like this much, uh, we have uh, some training which is um, on, if let's say you just discover Canva, you want to learn more about Canva, 
you can join uh, our training which is on 20th of March and 27th of March. This is advanced Canva. If you want to learn about uh, flip cooperative learning, which the framework I show you just now about um, what do you call that? Uh, yang ada recap, ada, ada recap session and then ada in detail tu semua tu. Uh, which also explain about cooperative learning, you can also join this course lah. If you want to know, to know more about these courses, you can visit our Facebook page, uh, Sekolah Malaysia, ataupun our IG, Sekolah Malaysia. Okay. Also, if let's say you want to uh, purchase Canva Pro, you can use Canva Pro free for 30 days, you can scan this QR code. Um, and, and after that, you can actually, if you want to purchase Canva Pro for yourself, um, it's roughly about, I think, 250 ringgit which you can use up to five users at one time, okay? All right. Uh, new things learn, Canva collaboration, HPL, useful expression session, you have given, thank you. We love to see the tools used during online learning and some examples or samples related to the usage of the tools. Boleh nanti, I can share with you. Uh, idea on how to improve my own teaching method and live the course, script, short limiting, how to student-centered. Anybody else would like to share their own reflection about what you have learned uh, in, in this session? <laughs> okay, so I hope that uh, it is a beneficial workshop to every one of you. Um, I... I Apologize for any mistakes that I've done. Ada kekurangan apa-apa, saya minta maaf. Uh, and thank you very much to come to invite me uh, for this session. Uh, actually, there are so many things that I can address. There are so many, um, of course, uh, when we talk about promoting cognitive engagement need, there are many things that can be done. Um, uh, but but you, need, you need to actually figure out ourselves first lah whether we are, we are actually, the most important part here, we have to ask ourselves, are we teaching for our own convenience or are we teaching for the sake of the students? Sebab kalau we teach for our own convenience, come what may, datanglah apa pedagogy dan sebagainya tu, memang kita tak akan guna because it's actually menyusahkan. <laughs> it will be actually difficult for us. But if let's say we really want to make sure that our students learn, we will come what may, we'll try our best just to make sure that the students are learning. So with that, I end my session. I pass back to Dr. Mazlina. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Tasri, for insightful and informative sharing. So I think um, we as a participant today learn a lot from Dr. Tasri. Uh, we also have the interactive session and engaging session. So I think um, it will... Um, we can use as uh, ideas in uh, in our class later on, especially for those who are still uh, struggling with the online classes. So, and in this uh, workshop also, Dr. Tazli um, highlight on the guiding principle in learning, and then we also are being exposed with the uh, learning framework, which is uh, very important, and the uh, important words also, and important approach also about the scaffolding of the students. Okay, in order for us to support student learning. And um, as well as Dr. Tazli also mentioned about the empathetic, um, empathetic skills where we become the instructor in the class. So I think this is a very important as well. We are make a combination between humanistic approach as well as the um, education uh, approach. And I think uh, Dr. Dr. Tazli also explained a lot about spectrum of student-centered learning, informal cooperative learning, as well as active learning. And he left us with the tips, nine tips just now. So I, I hope that all the participants um, gain ideas, gain um, beneficial information about uh, cognitive engagement during online remote learning. So um, with that, uh, Dr. Tazli, we end off our session for today. InsyaAllah ada masa kita akan jemput lagi, mungkin dengan um, tajuk yang berbeza uh, and then uh, tajuk yang berbeza dan uh, knowledge yang berbeza daripada Dr. Tazli untuk dikongsikan dengan all that can be in Unima. So with that, thank you very much Dr. Tazli. Thank you very much to all participants for today's session. And uh, Dr. Azra, anything? Dr. Azra, raise uh, hand. 
sorry, no. Thank you, Doctor, for uh, accepting our uh, invitation. And inshallah, if uh, we will invite Doctor again lah for our uh, next webinar ke apa ke. Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Right? Mm. So anything, we will contact you, Doctor. Thank you okay. very much for today's session. Okay. Thank you very much to all participants also. Inshallah, kita jumpa lagi dengan uh, next session uh, slot uh, uh, bengkel kita yang seterusnya pada minggu hadapan. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Take care, everyone.